suggested files and links in the two small boxes to the left of the main presentation screen. And included in the file downloads box is a presentation slides PDF, so that if you'd like to uh, download today's slides and make sure that you have them in hand, please feel free to do that. We'll also bring those back up during the Q&A portion. The session today is being recorded, so if you would like to share it with your colleagues uh, after the fact or review any piece, you will be able to do so. In addition, if you are a Twitter aficionado and you would like to follow along on Twitter, please use the hashtag AgEvents. And uh, also, please feel free to share your Twitter handle in the chat box. Lastly, we will be uh, using the chat box as a way to uh, take in questions. We encourage you to type in your questions throughout the seminar today. Uh, let us know what you're thinking, uh, if you have any resources you'd like to share. And we'll be pulling questions uh, between each speaker, especially clarifying questions, and then holding a few also until the end uh, if there are questions that are relevant to all three of our speakers. All right, uh, just to let you know about a couple of upcoming events we have, on January 28th, we will be hosting an Ask Ag Twitter chat focusing on volunteerism for agricultural development. And also, our next Ag Sector Council seminar for February will focus on drought-tolerant rice. And that will be on February 26th, next month. I'd also like to quickly call your attention to uh, a special event that is happening next week, focusing on nature, wealth, and power, uh, which new tools, ideas, and approaches for a changing global environment. Uh, this is an event that we encourage you to take a look at. It will be Monday, January 27th at 9 a.m. in the Ronald Reagan Building. And if you click on the slide that's on your screen right there on the registration links, um, you can sign up for this in person or online. And we've got four great speakers for this event and hope you will join. All right. Um, now, to get things started off, I would like to introduce Mofat Mugi with the USAID Bureau for Food Security. He is our climate change advisor, and he will be uh, giving a brief introduction to our topic today and uh, letting you know what we'll be focusing on. So I'll pass it on over to Mofat. Oh, thank you, Julie. Uh, yeah, as you heard, I sit in the Bureau for Food Security's uh, Country Strategies Implementation Office, and I'm usually working on uh, integration of climate change and natural resource management issues within our Feed the Future program. Uh, as you all know, we have the program that was launched in uh, 2010, and one of the key uh, cross-cutting themes is climate change and natural resource management. And today we have an opportunity to hear about some concrete examples of work that's going on uh, all over Africa as well as uh, applicable to the rest of the world that uh, focuses on regreening. So uh, we look forward to the activities. And please en engage us all uh, on, the, on the chat box and so on. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Mofat. All right. Now I would just like to give a quick introduction to our three speakers who will be presenting today. First up will be Craig Hansen with the World Resources Institute. And he is the director of WRI's People and Ecosystems Program. He has co-developed a number of the program's project work, including the Global Forest Watch 2.0 uh, and a few others. And he's also managed their Green Power Market Development Group, which is a coalition of a dozen Fortune 500 companies that helps pioneer corporate energy markets in the US. So he will be up first. And then we will switch over to Jerry Glover with the USAID Bureau for Food Security who is a National Geographic Society Explorer and sustain Senior Sustainable Agricultural Systems Advisor for USAID. And then lastly, we will be passing it on to Bob Winterbottom, also of World Resources Institute, who is the Director of WRI's Ecosystem Services Initiative and Deputy Director of the People and Ecosystems Program. All right, we will go ahead and jump right in since we got started just a bit late today. And so I will pass the microphone over to Craig. Thank you, Julie. Uh, good morning and good afternoon to everyone. Uh, this is Craig Hansen here. We have a very uh, exciting session today on solutions for scaling up regreening. Um, what I'd, the agenda for today's webinar is to briefly talk first about uh, the global food challenge and a menu of solutions for actually addressing that challenge, and then dive deep into improved land and water, man water management impacts 
and then really tackle the question of how do you actually scale up the successes that we've been seeing in places in sub-Saharan Africa, and then conclude by having a bit of discussion. So I'm going to kick off by at the global level for a moment before we dive more deeply into sub-Saharan Africa and regreening to lay out uh, what we are talking here at WRI and some of our partners talking about the menu of solutions to creating a sustainable food future. Uh, every three years, uh, the World Resources Institute uh, publishes research called the World Resources Report, where we pick a topic or theme at the nexus of environment and development uh, that is a pertinent issue of the day. And for the current World Resources Report, we've chosen the theme of creating a sustainable food future. Uh, we don't do this research alone. Uh, our partners in this endeavor include the World Bank, the United Nations Environment Program, and the United Nations Development Program. And for this, uh, this uh, World Resources Report, we're also working with two French agriculture research institutions, CIRHAD and INRA. Uh, we recently published our interim findings, the cover page of which you see here on the screen, and which can be accessed uh, through the website in the upper left-hand corner of your screen. Uh, and if you want hard copies, you can feel free to contact us and we can send them to you. And the question we actually are, 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 are tackling in this World Resources Report is the following, is how can the world feed more than 9 billion people in the year 2050 in a manner that advances economic development as well as reduces pressure on the environment? And in our view, uh, we think that this is one of the grand challenges of the next 40 years. And to answer that question, uh, we believe that it requires a great balancing act of three needs. First, the world needs to close a food gap. Uh, the world actually needs about 69% more calories in the year 2050 than was available in the year 2006 to, to adequately feed the entire population of 9.6 billion by the year 2050. That's a massive increase in food availability that has not been seen on an absolute basis in the history of, of humankind. The second need we have is that the world needs agriculture to continue to support economic and social development. More than a quarter of the world's population is directly or indirectly employed by agriculture. Agriculture is a foundation for many national economies. It's a means of, 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 of the livelihood for, for people in rural communities and a means of lifting people out of poverty if, if, done, if done right. On the third need is actually the need to actually reduce agriculture's environmental impact. It's interesting to, to note the, the share of impact that agriculture has across a variety of environmental parameters. So take, take greenhouse gas emissions, for instance. About a quarter of all the planet's greenhouse gas emissions per year are generated by agriculture directly or by land use change, the majority of which is triggered by agriculture. Or look at land use. You know, 37% of the Earth's land mass is used to grow food outside of Antarctica. Or take water. You know, 70% of the world's water withdrawals are used for, by agriculture, and even more, more, more than 80% of the waters that's actually consumed is consumed by agriculture. So agriculture has a big impact on the environment as well. So <clears throat> what we are doing in, with the World Bank, UNEP, and UNDP, and the World Resources Report is coming up with a menu of solutions to actually cre create and achieve a, a, a sustainable food future. A menu of solutions that actually helps close the food gap between now and the year 2050, as well as meets a number of development and environmental criteria, namely you know, helping to alleviate poverty, helping to advance gender equity <coughs> and the, and the <coughs> livelihoods of women, <coughs> reducing the conversion and impact on ecosystems, uh, reducing agriculture's contribution to greenhouse gas emissions, as well as reducing agriculture's consumption and pressure on freshwater resources. That's a big ask, right? But this, you know, the, 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 to create a stable food future, in our view, requires a, a, a suite or a menu of strategies that actually meets all of these criteria. <clears throat> Just briefly, and we lay these out in our interim findings, I wanted to share with you a few of the menu items. <clears throat> On the consumption side, we, we aren't just looking at production, we're also looking at consumption side. You see 
the four menu items there that we dive more deeply into uh, as being part, in our view, of a sustainable food future. Uh, one of them uh, is, is to reduce food loss and waste. And about eight months ago or so, we, we released one of the installments of the World Resources Report where we dove more deeply into this question of the problem of food loss and waste. As you know, about a quarter of all the calories generated are lost between farm and fork. That's a massive amount of that's a massive amount of inefficiencies, right? Now, where food loss and waste occurs in the value chain actually varies by region. Here on the slide before you, you see that the vast majority of food loss and waste actually occurs uh, close close to the farm. You know, in production and in handling and storage, say in sub-Saharan Africa. Whereas if you go to other parts of the planet, like North America and Europe, uh, more than more than half of the food loss and waste occurs near the near the fork, near the point of consumption. In fact, in North America, 61 percent of the food calories lost and wasted occurs at the home or in restaurants. So the nature of the problem differs by where you're on the planet. Now, this data here comes from the FAO. Now, but it's at a regional level. But one thing in our research that we found is that countries and companies are starting to ask more and more for information about how much and where food is being lost and wasted within their own country boundaries and within their own corporate food supply chains. Uh, and that data doesn't exist. In fact, no, no methodology exists for actually measuring that. And so in the spirit of what gets, what gets measured gets managed, uh, what we've done is we've kicked off a process uh, in, in October of, of 2013 to develop what's called a global food loss and waste protocol. This will be a standardized approach for measuring and monitoring food loss and waste within national borders and within corporate supply chains. We're doing it with a number of partners there you see on the screen, the FAO, UNEP. Uh, we have several uh, organizations involved with the private sector, such as the Rural Business Council for Sustainable Development. So it'll be a global protocol applicable to any country on the planet, as well as any company and any corporate supply chain. Just an example of a, the types of solutions that we're starting to develop through this World Resources Report. On the production side, uh, we're looking at both, uh, on our menu is activities to actually sustainably increase crop yields, as well as activities to sustainably increase product, product, the productivity of livestock the amount of meat per hectare uh, that can be produced on, on the planet, looking at both uh, land-based uh, livestock as well as fish. Uh, in terms of sustainably increasing crop yields, as, as many of you on this webinar are aware, it's an acute problem, especially in sub-Saharan Africa. And as you see on the slide here, you've seen the growth in terms of metric tons per hectare of cereal yields uh, over the past uh, 50 years and the degree to which sub-Saharan Africa still has relatively low yields. So this is a pertinent issue that we're going to dive into more deeply today with a, a set of strategies that actually could help boost those yields for sub-Saharan Africa. In the WRR, we're looking at a, at a variety of means of actually boosting uh, crop yields. One is to uh, improve uh, yields to uh, advan leveraging advances in genomics, uh, which is actually DNA analysis, to actually help advance and, and accelerate uh, the uh, increased I increases in productivity through conventional plant breeding uh, and through looking at, at options such as orphan crops, those crops that uh, are a source of food and nutrition for many people, but they haven't yet to receive a lot of the analysis and research support that some of the staple crops like wheat and corn have received over the years. Likewise, another strategy on our, on our menu is to improve land and water management practices, enriching soil organic matter, you know, you know, retaining soil moisture through a variety of practices such as agroforestry and water harvesting and the like to actually help boost yields in, in lower uh, in currently lower productivity regions of the planet. And we're going to dive into this menu item in a few moments. The final element of our portfolio is, to, is a series of menu items that are about Im improving the environmental uh, and performance of agriculture uh, but doesn't but, but through measures that don't necessarily increase the amount of calories produced, but do reduce the amount of pressure. And we call these uh, the production methods menu items, including improving livestock feeding efficiency, increasing the efficiency of fertilizer use, and managing rice paddies to reduce emissions, especially of greenhouse gases. And if, if you wonder why we've chosen those, uh, this next slide here gives you an indication of that. If you look at 
The greenhouse gas emissions from just agricultural production directly. Ag contributes about 13% of global greenhouse gas emissions currently. If you look at that, uh, ruminants, your, your, your cattle, your sheep, your goats, uh, comprise almost 50% of those emissions. The, 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 the bars on, the, on the, the, the yellow and the orange bars on the, on the right-hand side. Uh, issues dealing with soil fertilization and fertilizer application are 20% of, of, of those emissions. And rice paddies alone emit 10% of the greenhouse gas emissions that come from agriculture. So combine those three areas, ruminants, fertilization, and rice are about 75% of the greenhouse gas emissions from agricultural production. And hence, finding strategies to help reduce those emissions while still uh, helping to feed the planet are of critical importance. So that's a bit of the menu. To learn more about it, I encourage you to read our interim findings. The final World Resources Report will be, will be coming out later on this year. But now we're going to dive deep into one of those menu items, namely yeah, the improvements of land and water management. And to that, I'll turn to Jerry Glover. Good day, all, and uh, thank you, Craig, for a great introduction to the topic. And I certainly want to thank all my colleagues over at uh, WRI for um, getting this report organized and on the agenda. It's uh, important to the mission of USAID and many other organizations looking at how we can meet those challenges that Craig laid out over the next uh, 50 years. For farmers in sub-Saharan Africa, when we uh, say that they, for regional food security needs, they need to uh, increase food production, that's a, that's a big challenge because many farmers in many regions of sub-Saharan Africa face some, some serious biophysical limitations associated with soil, water, and uh, intercepting sunlight, of course, important for uh, plant productivity. So we're essentially asking farmers to, in many cases, double their production at the same time that they are uh, rehabilitating heavily degraded lands or lands that are inherently poor to begin with, and address the issues of climate change adaptation. And increasingly, farmers are being looked to to decrease their climate change, uh, their, their greenhouse gas emissions. So as Craig pointed out, this is a big ask and farmers are facing what I think are some unique and, and uh, big challenges that, uh, as a global community, we need to come together and, and help offer some solutions. So my intention today is not to uh, thoroughly cover the uh, possible approaches that uh, the working paper, Improving Land and Water Management, uh, that WRI has produced, uh, but just to give a brief overview identify some of the key challenges uh, in land and water management, and some of the basic uh, ecological principles of why the strategies that we've identified, the four strategies that we've identified, why they actually work in boosting productivity and uh, addressing some of those other challenges. But first, just to go through some of the key challenges many sub-Saharan African farmers face, uh, in terms of soil, many of Africa's land, uh, lands are very ancient, so they're very weathered. Some of the key nutrients have been leached out of uh, the system just through natural weathering processes. And then farmers over the centuries or thousands of years of farming have actually withdrawn more nutrients than than has been replaced. This type of nutrient mining is uh, quite severe and, and extensive in sub-Saharan Africa. The lower productivity that's in part due to those poor soil conditions uh, means that the soil isn't protected as well by plants. So that often actually increases the erosion. So not only are we mining the soils, uh, we're also uh, creating higher rates of erosion many times. And of course, uh, both nutrient mining and erosion is related to the management of water. When we get low productivity systems, we typically get high rates of runoff. So when the rain falls, often 70% uh, can be lost through surface runoff. Some more can be lost through deep soil um, uh, percolation. And the soils, if they don't 
have uh, large amounts of soil organic matter or clay, they can actually have low storage potential, uh, uh, low potential to store that water. And this all means that too little of the water falling on the landscape is actually cycled through plants uh, and transpired out. That's where we want a lot of that water to be directed through the plants. Uh, and that, that basically sponsors plant productivity, capturing sunlight, uh, uh, transpiring water. That is all, those are all indications of good plant productivity. And of course, the result is if you have small uh, failing plants on an eroded landscape, you're actually intercepting too little of the sunlight that's available during the growing season. And of course, ultimately, farmers rely on the sunlight uh, and the plants to convert that sunlight into uh, energy for both below ground processes, but of course, for our above ground harvest. So those are some of the challenges that they face in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. And we're just going to run through briefly uh, what that looks like, some of those processes and some of the characteristics. If we start out with a, um, a natural ecosystem and some of the characteristics of it, we see, and, and can, can they see the uh, pointer moving across the slide? Actually, Jerry, if you'd like to use a uh I thought I did. Oh, I see it now. Oh. How do I move that one around, though? Kind of grab it. Okay. Okay. Well, we'll just go on without a pointer. It would have been useful. But you'll see the five suns that I have on this slide. That depicts the uh, the the sunlight that can be intercepted throughout the whole growing season. Uh, and for good plant productivity, of course, you want to in intercept, you want your plants intercepting as much of that as possible. And of course, rain, the rain falling on the land, we want a lot of that uh, soaking into the soil, being so stored in the soil for uptake by the plants, and very little runoff, uh, little evaporation from the soil surface. And then native plant communities, typically dominated by perennial plants with uh, uh, deep roots, often three meters deep or more, uh, we, we have a good environment for capturing that water, storing it in the soil, and then having it be released uh, from the uh, release to the plants for high productivity. And in fact, um, natural plant communities typically have produced more net primary pr productivity than our farming systems. So through farming, we've actually, in most regions of the world, decreased net primary productivity. These native plant communities are very good at intercepting sunlight, managing the water, protecting the soil, and accessing resources very deep in the soil. Now, we've changed that quite a bit with agriculture. You'll see I have two of the suns at the top of the slide partially blacked out. And that's because uh, with single cropping systems, uh, oftentimes we have no crops growing, even though the, uh, the, the sunlight's available, water's available, and, some, and, and so on. So when you have a poorly protected soil surface, low, low plant growth, uh, much of the rainfall actually runs off the soil surface as much as 70% um, as I said before. And of course that creates erosion. Many of our main primary crops that we rely on for our food calories have fairly shallow root systems. So they're actually only accessing uh, a, a small portion of the soil volume. And that means their access to nutrients and water is limited. So you get this downward cycle of um, uh, worsening conditions. The soils are eroded, uh, plants aren't able to generate much energy below ground in the form of plant sugars being released through root activity, and therefore you're not capturing much of the sunlight. Uh, you have all kinds of problems with uh, land degradation, the need to uh, expand agriculture onto new lands, and so on. So this is, these are the types of activities we want to uh, uh, reverse and achieve some of those characteristics uh, of um, uh, the native ecosystems. And we can do it through a, through a variety, 
to a range of approaches uh, based on sound land management practices. This is a slide um, essentially showing some conservation agriculture practices where crop residues are maintained on the soil surface to prevent excessive runoff, to prevent erosion. Uh, it's fair, this can be a fairly simplified system, but still just basic uh, soil management practices can achieve uh, a, a, lot, a lot of the benefits that we want. Uh, that simple system, though, may not still capture the full amount of uh, sunlight during the growing season that's available. Uh, I still have that one sun blocked out slightly. But we can get a bit more uh, sophisticated, and farmers actually use fairly complex systems to uh, in their everyday uh, systems. For example, here we have a an agroforestry system combined with conservation ag, where the soil is protected. We're still growing um, a staple food crop, intercropped with a perennial legume, and uh, supported by uh, my poor depiction of a Phyderbia albida tree that, uh, you know, it, during the maize growing season, uh, it, it's not growing, so it's not competing with the maize, but it is providing some inputs into the system in terms of uh, nitrogen and other nutrients generated by its leaves uh, that are dropped uh, when the maize isn't growing. So we can, uh, we, again, we have a, quite a range here that offers farmers much more opportunity to capture sunlight, better manage the water, and uh, protect the soil surface. One of the key strategies I think that we'll be seeing as climate change impacts farmers more is essentially going deeper into the soil for resilience and greater access to water and uh, nutrients. So uh, just to begin um, going into the four different strategies that, uh, that we identified based on the evidence uh, available in the literature and on the ground in the regions that we were focused on, uh, probably one of the most prominent, most widely known is agroforestry. Uh, trees with their deep roots, their uh, long lifespans can really introduce a, 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 a lot of resilience to a system. In dry years when no crop is going to be harvested even under the best of circumstances, trees can provide a range of goods and services that farmers can rely on to get them through those hard periods. In terms of uh, Im impact on staple food crops, uh, we find a lot of evidence that they can be have very positive Im impacts, such as uh, from this study in Zambia, in which over a number of years, uh, these Phyderbia albida or fertilizer trees had very positive impacts on maize yields. The trees are providing nitrogen through uh, biological nitrogen fixation. They're mining nutrients deep in the soil, bringing them up above the soil in the, in the leaves, and then uh, the leaves fall on the soil surface. When they break down, they release critical nutrients that uh, can really help boost crop production. They also uh, help um, protect the soil surface, allowing more water to infiltrate into the soil, keeping it from running off. And so you get uh, some microclimatic effects there, benefits from the trees as well. Now, a uh, second one that's it's quite popular in the developed world and is widely adopted in the United States and in some countries in South America is uh, catching on more widely in um, Sub-Saharan Africa. It's, uh, it comes in various forms in Sub-Saharan Africa as it's been adapted to specific local conditions. But here you have a, a, a field where you can see the crop residue covering the soil surface between the crop rows. And I should note, uh, right behind the farmer, you see some trees growing in the fields. Uh, those look to me like Phyderbia uh, trees. And you'll notice that it's the growing season for the main crop there. But there are no trees, uh, no leaves on those trees, so they're not competing heavily uh, with the crop. So, con uh, as we'll see, conservation agriculture, like any one of these practices, can be combined with other practices for for benefit. Just as an example, in Malawi, 
um, if we use conservation agriculture practices, and I should mention that uh, those typically consist of three, three components. One is the uh, uh, you want to minimize soil disturbance, so we go with no tillage or reduced tillage options. The farmer must keep the soil protected with uh, crop residues or with living plant cover. And then there's some level of diversity through rotation or intercropping uh, to get the benefit of multiple crops. So if we just go with conservation agriculture, uh, you get uh, about a ton per hectare yield boost uh, by switching to converse, conservation agriculture alone. When you combine it, though, with agroforestry, you can get a, uh, a, a fairly dramatic rise even above conservation agriculture alone. So by combining these strategies, farmers are getting uh, good yields and, and good results. Another category of land and water management practices that have uh, been critical, and these might be more even more critical in some of the drier regions, uh, is uh, rainwater harvesting. So ensuring that the rainwater that, that falls on the landscape is uh, prevented from running off. It's kept on the farm field. And in fact, in this picture shown here, it's been concentrated in smaller areas uh, because the rain, overall rainfall is, is low enough that uh, it can be concentrated in specific areas for much greater uh, yields. Now, rainwater harvesting doesn't just uh, come in, uh, in this form, but there's a range of examples. The Zy pits where farmers can um, uh, concentrate the water and nutrients in a specific spot for each uh, plant works. So there's a range, again, a range of options under this category. And again, when you combine uh, rainwater harvesting techniques together using a, a range of them, you can get farmers often see multiplied benefits. So in two different regions in Burkina Faso, uh, where they were looking at stone buns that were uh, capturing water across larger areas of land. And then the Zy pits, which concentrate water in much smaller areas. You use those together, and farmers see uh, uh, pretty dramatic rises. You'll notice that the levels of productivity are still around one ton per hectare, even when those full water management practices are combined. So in many regions, we have to even go further and combine those with other for fertilizer uh, management practices to get to the uh, levels of production needed to really reduce uh, food insecurity. Which brings us to um, the fourth strategy covered in the report. And again, um, you know, I'm just covering uh, some top level uh, concepts. And I, I do encourage you to look at the report where these uh, many more details are provided. So integrated soil fertility management typically refers to um, a range of combinations of using inorganic fertilizers as well as uh, organic fertilizers. In these poor soils, it's often been seen that if you use uh, synthetic fertilizers alone, say urea or uh, other blends of fertilizers, without the addition of organic materials, those fertilizers are used only inefficiently. Uh, Often, more than 50% of the applied fertilizer is lost through um, rain, rainwater running off the soil surface or, are, or is leached below the root zones. If you add organic matter to the soil, you can get much greater uh, fertilizer use efficiencies. And of course, that's reflected in yields. Just as an example, uh, here, are, here is some data from, again, from Burkina Faso showing the combination of integrated soil fertility management with some of those water storing, uh, water, cap, uh, water harvesting techniques, as well as agroforestry. So stone lines, creating stone lines to capture water, that's a water harvesting technique. The farmer managed natural regeneration, that's one form of agroforestry. 
the half moons uh, that we saw in the uh, previous water harvesting photo is another type of uh, water capture. And you'll see in all cases when you use either agroforestry or uh, water harvesting techniques combined with uh, integrated soil fertility management practices, in this case uh, specifically microdosing, then you get benefits above those practices alone. Just to go back on microdosing, in this picture you see a farmer applying small amounts of fertilizer to a, um, it looks like a maize-based system uh, that's intercropped with legumes. So the legumes are providing some of the organic inputs to the system while the farmer is applying small amounts of uh, inorganic fertilizers to get the full, benef full benefit that we see in these slides, in these data. And then finally, I just wanted to put a, a, a human face on uh, the impact that these strategies can have uh, on real farmers. Uh, you see Rhoda Mignon from uh, Malawi here in the photo. She, she and her granddaughter are sitting over a soil pit that was dug in her maize field. The trees there are those Fiderbia albida trees that I spoke about earlier. But you can see the roots, the tree roots, extending deep down below the maize plants, uh, breaking through some of the hard pans. Her soil was able to soak up and store much more water than her neighbors who did not use trees. Uh, but she didn't just use agroforestry alone. She also used uh, a form of conservation agriculture. On the picture in the right, you'll see the maize residue from the previous season there on the soil surface. I found three years of accumulation of uh, crop residues in between her maize rows. So that covers the soil, really provides a lot of weed suppression, uh, a lot of organic material into the soil so that when the rain falls, it's, uh, it soaks in very nicely and is held in the soil. And with this system, uh, using uh, conservation ag, integrated soil fertility, where she's adding her animal manures back to the uh, field as well, and agroforestry, Rhoda essentially rehabilitated a very unproductive piece of land and is now food secure, economically secure, and resilient during these uh, frequent droughts that they experience in that area. It also now allows her to um, use, purchase, improve cultivars and, and fertilizers to boost her yields even further. So she's reliably getting four to five tons per hectare. Uh, so that just covers uh, quite a range of uh, different options for those four strategies we identified in our, um, in our report. I do encourage you to look there for the references and for further details. Now, uh, the question is, how do we scale this up? How do we get more farmers across broader landscapes adopting these practices uh, and meeting these challenges that Craig laid out earlier? Um, Robert Winterbottom will, I believe, take off from there and, and uh, discuss some of the challenges of scaling up. Thank you, Jerry. And uh, good morning, everyone, and good afternoon for those colleagues in, um, and others in, in, in Sub-Saharan Africa and, and around the world. I realize we've been talking for a while, um, but uh, I, I do want to quickly go through a few additional points. I see already questions popping up about how these can these practices can go to scale. So that's what I'd like to dive into. Um, as Craig has mentioned, uh, certainly uh, there's challenges and it's going to require a kind of a balancing act uh, because there, there are many different aspects, many things need to happen in order to, to move forward with this menu of solutions. And as Jerry has noted, uh, we can do a lot more to shift and to make for much more efficient production systems that are higher yielding and that mimic these natural uh, systems and, 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 and manage as agroecosystems and, and in the process address some of these land degradation challenges. Uh, globally, um, WRI and IUCN have estimated that there are some 2 billion hectares of land that has been deforested and degraded around the world, an area twice the size of China. And, and this could be made much more productive uh, by scaling up a lot of these practices uh, just in sub-Saharan Africa, there's more than 65% of the land that has been degraded. 
from the erosion, from uh, uh, the nutrient uh, mining, the, the problems uh, that are associated with these conventional practices that Jerry was speaking of. Uh, so uh, we see certainly a great need and an opportunity to scale up and to uh, bring to more farmers the benefits of these practices that Jerry has just been talking about. Um, and, and as you'll see in the, the map in the working paper, uh, in sub-Saharan Africa, we look, for example, if you look across this range of, um, of cropland in Africa where rainfall is about 400 to 1,000 millimeters, uh, that's very much the range of Federbia albida and some of these other nitrogen-fixing legumes and agroforestry systems that could really boost yields. Uh, we estimate that there's about 300 million hectares of cropland in this rainfall range outside of protected areas. And um, if we had a... a really modest level of adoption of these practices on 25% of those 300 million hectares and it yields uh, were increased by 50% which is quite a conservative estimate based on what farmers have done in some areas that would produce an additional 22 million tons of food for sub-Saharan Africa so this is something that can have a very significant impact that 22 million tons could translate to 615 kilocalories per person per day enough to feed 285 million people so uh, we really urgently need to think about how can we uh, move ahead and, and see more Niger's where we have 5 million hectares of land that's been restored, that's been made much more productive. How can that be scaled up tenfold or more? Because the opportunity and the need is certainly there. As we think about scaling strategies, we've looked to how it's actually happened in other areas. What have been some of the key pathways or some of the key interventions that really has driven scaling? Has, has led to widespread adoption by farmers of some of these improved practices. And it seems that most often there are at least five elements. Uh, and these are detailed in the paper, but and I'll just go through them briefly for you. But they, 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 they come around to reinforcing communication, making a stronger economic case, mapping the potential so that we know and can target where these practices are, 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 have a high uh, chance of, of being adopted, Diagnosing uh, needed policy reforms to reduce barriers to their adoption and supporting capacity building to really uh, fuel and drive this uh, adoption at a, at a wide scale. So to come to this first key scaling up strategy, which is reinforcing communication and outreach. This is an essential one because it really starts with just a much higher level of dialogue. There are many farmers out there that are innovating, that are responding to these issues of land degradation, that are looking for ways to boost soil organic matter, to recover and reduce rainfall runoff, and to do these other things. And if we have a better understanding by talking, exploring, uh, investigating what these farmers are doing and where and how, and uh, that, that is a first big insight into what can be done to get other farmers to be doing what they've already started to pioneer and, and innovate and do. Uh, another way to do that is to actually move the farmers themselves around. Take those that have adopted these practices and are benefiting from them and have others come and see them because seeing is believing, helping them learn from one another. Farmer to farmer visits has really played a key role in helping these practices to spread. They can also be documented uh, through video documentaries and others. There's been really relatively modest investment in doing that, but if that's done on a larger scale and there's more effort to disseminate information about that, we think that can play a key role. Uh, and, and recognizing the achievements, um, uh, the, the ministries can really sort of take a note of this and, and award villagers to highlight them through ra uh, radio programs that, that reach even illiterate farmers and that uh, have wide exposure. So there's, there's multiple pathways. Again, the paper uh, talks about all the different facets of communication and outreach. There's new web technologies there, in information communication technologies that help uh, give greater voice to farmers. All of these things can be uh, mobilized to really um, spread the word and, and enable and, and empower farmers to sort of take note of what can be done and to move them forward in adopting these practices. A second key area is making the economic case. Uh, because uh, especially from the perspective of farmers, uh, they're going to adopt these practices when they see that it makes economic sense to them. It's not too risky and it provides benefits, particularly in the short term. And, and it doesn't require a lot of uh, uh, resources that they, they cannot invest. Uh, 
Uh, and, and that's the case for many of these practices. They have a relatively th low threshold of adoption in terms of external resources that are required. It's mainly access to knowledge and, and, and uh, reducing some barriers that we'll talk about in a minute. So farmers will invest, but if we want to really bring around gov government to play the role they need to in the development community, we do need to sort of make a strong economic case, which uh, involves fuller accounting of the benefits, and, and, and uh, we need to support uh, more research, more efforts to document uh, and to understand, uh, fill our knowledge gaps in terms of uh, how, these thing, how these practices really do impact hydrology, uh, affect water tables, how they contribute to resilience of climate change, and so on. Uh, the farmers aren't really waiting for more of these studies, but it's important we've seen that these studies and, and uh, making the economic case can, uh, can help other stakeholders, particularly government and development and assistance, uh, to, to really play their role in scaling up. Um, a case in point is uh, in, the, in Malawi. Um, I was out there recently talking with the Ministry of Agriculture. They're quite focused. Uh, they have a ma massive program to subsidize uh, uh, mineral fertilizers, uh, and they're thinking about sort of different inputs that they can provide. You talk to the Ministry of Forestry, they're very concerned about you know, the remaining areas of natural forest and how to manage them better. But uh, very few uh, in the government now really have uh, sort of kept track of what's been going on as a result of the conventional approaches. And, and there has been a, a high level of land degradation, a depletion of soil nutrients, the problems that uh, Jerry talked about from these fairly, uh, you know, a focus on tobacco, on maize systems, and, and not uh, incorporating uh, uh, more resource conserving practices. Farmers are struggling to find enough manure, compost to kind of replenish the soil organic matter. And as a result, many of them have started to do things that we see in Mali, that we see in Burkina, that we see in Niger. Some of the same species, uh, not just Fidervia albida, but many of the other um, shrubs like Peleostigma, uh, Bohemia, the Combratums, the Terminalias, uh, they're out there uh, actively. Uh, protecting, regenerating these trees on their farm fields, increasing the density of the vegetation because they're recognizing that this is a very cost-effective way, this farmer-managed natural regeneration, to begin to address those soil degradation things and in the process produce more uh, fuel wood, produce the fodder they need to, and, and generate the other benefits uh, that help them become more resilient and productive farmers and that mimic the agroecosystems and follow those principles that Jerry outlined earlier. So. Uh, it is under the radar, and some of the uh, extension messages uh, don't fully support it yet. So uh, that's, again, a, an important part is to make the case and convince people to sort of catch up to the farmers in some cases. Um, another uh, area is, is to build on this understanding from that increased dialogue and just sort of taking stock of what farmers are doing and why, uh, and to, and to uh, figure out where these practices are taking off, under what conditions, and then you're in a position to begin to map and target the high potential areas. Here you see Gray Tappan, who is well known for helping us to understand that this farmer managed natural regeneration has already taken off on some 500,000 hectares in the Sino Plains of, of Mali, and he was a, played a key role with some of his colleagues there in understanding the dynamics of the spread of the farmer managed natural regeneration in Niger. And again, um, we're now uh, getting a better understanding in the case of Burkina Faso. Uh, for example, Zais, the ones that have been championed by champion farmers like uh, Yacuba Suadago uh, in the area of Wayaguya. Um, this could, is now probably practiced on some 200, 300,000 hectares. But we wanted to look at what, how, how suitable is, is the landscape for extending Zai to a much larger area. So we've uh, carefully looked at uh, the characteristics of soils, whether it's sandy or, or, uh, or clay or hard pan or not. The rainfall ranges, uh, Zai is particularly well suited when the rainfall is in the area of 400 to 800 millimeters. Land cover, uh, uh, Zai's of course work uh, well on the cropland and the farmer managed natural regeneration can even go on pasture land. Population density, other sort of factors that sort of are favor in, or make these areas more highly suitable for the adoption of some of these practices. And in looking those closely and mapping out all these parameters at a national level, which is, can't so, be so easily done when one's looking at the scale of the whole continent, um, one looks in, and finds that actually Zai is, is quite highly suitable on some 5 million hectares in Burkina. Similarly, for farmer-managed natural regeneration, the same kind of 
close analysis of multiple factors uh, led us to understand that maybe seven and a half million hectares uh, of land could uh, farmer managed natural regeneration could be extended out in these areas where you have sandy deeper soils and 400 to 1,000 millimeters. And uh, given what Jerry was saying about the documented evidence for the boost in yields from these practices, uh, extending these practices uh, out to something on the order of uh, five, six, seven million hectares would would produce another 2.5 million tons of cereal in, in uh, Niger, again, in Burkina Faso, excuse me. Again, quite a significant outcome and something we should think about, OK, so how can we make that happen or, or facilitate and enable that? Um, another case of sort of mapping out the potential is in Rwanda, where WRI and IUCN have been working to assess the opportunities for scaling up agroforestry. You think of agroforestry as already well adopted, but in point of fact, on sloping lands, even more agroforestry or uh, increased density of agroforestry species could be extended out to reduce erosion on flat lands to further boost its contribution to soil fertility, and on uh, pasture lands to add additional sources of production of fodder. Again, uh, this can be estimated and even uh, uh, talk about the economic benefits, which again plays a key role in making the case to the government so that they provide the leadership and begin to address what's an, a fourth area, which is diagnosing policy and institutional reform. We've seen that the economic benefits really drive scaling from the perspective of the farmer, but there's certain policy and institutional barriers that can really impede or slow down the widespread adoption of these practices. And some of you are familiar with that, but uh, they're out there, those, these, these factors that can work against it, whether it's insecure uh, tenure or management, unclear management rights to trees on farms, or heavy-handed uh, enforcement of regulations by a forest department, or other things that impede the market access and, and undercut uh, what could have been the economic incentives that would drive adoption of these practices. Here you see um, uh, uh, stakeholders that included some of these pioneering innovative farmers, the director of the Forest Service, uh, members uh, of government working on agriculture, they were all came together in a workshop last year in Burkina Faso to sort of consider what's been the experience with these practices, how important that is in terms of uh, livelihoods and food security and resilience for farmers, and what are some of the barriers uh, as articulated by the farmers and, and others themselves, and, and how could they be overcome, whether it's uh, revising the, making further revisions in the forest code or other things. Um, just quickly moving on, another tool that can be used in this is something that we're pioneering now. Having looked at key success factors uh, based on restoration experiences, uh, successful cases of large-scale restoration around the world, uh, we, we recognize that uh, there are lots of different factors that can contribute to successful restoration. And by systematically diagnosing them, those factors that contribute to motivating the behavior change or enabling it or to actually implementing the actions that help for scaling these things up, you can sort of see, are they in place, uh, indicated by a green on the right-hand column, or could, do they deserve some more attention, a yellow, or are there really a barrier now in place, as indicated by the red, and something that urgently needs to be addressed if you want to successfully scale things up. So a lot to be done in the area of policy and institutional analysis and reform. A final one I'll mention before we go on to the discussion is to support capacity building. And again, this kind of circles back to some of those communication-related activities. It, it involves getting out and ensuring that uh, there's, there's sufficient support given to uh, supporting peer-to-peer -peer learning and, and training amongst farmers, uh, sufficient support given to build the knowledge platform so that as knowledge is gained about the benefits and the effectiveness of these practices or key things that trigger their adoption. For example, in the area of conservation agriculture, uh, uh, Jerry alluded to this, that it's been widely now taken up in many developing or more industrialized countries. We know there's certain constraints to it in, in sub-Saharan Africa, but there are also systems where they're overcoming that through a, a variety of practices like the work of total land care in Malawi. So we can document how they've been able to do it to get through the transition period, to break over some of those obstacles, whether it's uh, re retaining crop residues for other practices. We know something about how to move forward on this and uh, to increase the benefits further by integrating agroforestry and conservation agriculture. A key factor, too, is uh, a lot of these uh, systems, it, it comes down to managing the resource base 
uh, not only on the farm field, but in the larger landscape in promoting approaches of integrated landscape management. And oftentimes, that requires some strengthening of community-based organizations if you want to start to do a better job of controlling the access and use. And farmers are going to be quite discouraged to do farmer managed natural regeneration if they have no ability to make some rules and to, to enforce some rules so that the trees that they regenerate on their farms aren't just sort of lopped inadvertently by someone or harvested by another person or they run their cows through it, their livestock, and degrade it, and so on. So that's an important thing as well, uh, to build capacity at that local level for those building blocks, those community-based organizations, and ensure that those institutions work well. Um, I'd like to also uh, mention that uh, much of what we've learned about what can drive scaling comes from some of these stock-taking activities that have been carried out in Burkina, Niger, and other countries. And USAID has, has generally supported that in the past. And, uh, and it's important also to continue to build capacity so that this stock taking and improve monitoring and assessment and analysis of what are some of the drivers, what can be done to, to implement things at scale, that that's uh, built into the work of national institutions. Uh, we have NGOs that are in this area, like Rizzo Marp. Uh, there's national agencies as well. Um, and uh, so that's an area of further capacity building as well, so that on an ongoing basis, we're, we're doing a better job of, of uh, catching some of these things that are now under the radar and bringing them out and, and, and bringing them to the attention of national leaders and others. A final point is to m make sure that if we want to go to scale, we're going to have to integrate attention to gender. Uh, as it is in many of these uh, landscapes and, and rural communities, women lack access to some of the rights and, and access to information. Uh, so they need to be the special uh, particular needs of promoting gender equality need to be taken into account in the communication strategies and the other scaling interventions. It's been estimated that uh, agricultural yields could be boosted by over 20, 25 percent if we just did a better job of making progress with gender equality and making uh, the access to the information and the other support uh, more equitably available. Um, so let me close then with a few key takeaways. Um, uh, it's kind of summarizing from all three of our presentations. Uh, uh, we believe that success in increasing agricultural production is going to be dependent on addressing some of these land and water management issues. Right now, some 6 million hectares of land are degraded each year in sub-Saharan Africa. So we can't make progress if we're, we're <laughs> losing uh, productive land faster than we're, we're upgrading and, and restoring it. So we've got to turn that around and shift to more productive and, and sustainable systems by giving more attention to uh, uh, renewing, replenishing soil organic matter, which has such a key role in increasing the efficiency of fertilizer use. Then it becomes more cost effective for farmers to, to buy fertilizer, and those whole value chains can start to function once you deal with some of these fundamental blocks like depletion of soil organic matter and, and high rates of rainfall runoff and so on. And these practices that we've talked about are very cost ways for doing that, increasing trees and perennials in the farming, in the farming systems and so on. Uh, another key point, I think, is that there is evidence. We don't need to be skeptical uh, about some of these practices. Farmers are starting to adopt them at scale. Uh, the, document, the evidence has been documented. We know not only are there good results from some of these practices, but particularly when they're integrated and particularly when they're combined, particularly when they're mainstreamed, it's not an either-or situation, but, but working them into the other things that we're doing, whether it's providing good germplasm or or are doing other issues to strengthen the value chains. And that these farmer-led improvements can be cost-effective and can make a real contribution to food security on a, on a significant scale, as well as to resilience and climate change adaptation and, and even reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and that these practices are, are adding to the resilience because of diversifying incomes and helping farmers to secure their livelihoods. So we've got a lot of in innovation and progress and knowledge to build on. And there's very clear uh, uh, ways that one can invest in scaling them up based on the experience we've had and based on what's worked well in other places. But we just need to, to spend uh, more time and thought and effort in the communication and the addressing the barriers and uh, building the capacity and, and targeting these areas and, and moving forward to, to support the scaling up. Uh, so I'll close there and look forward, really, to your questions. Thank you very much.
Thank you so much, Craig, Jerry, and Bob. A three really excellent presentations with a lot of information. Um, we have been recording this, so if anyone missed any piece of it, they can uh, have the chance to go back and uh, review various pieces. I want to thank all of the participants for your robust questions and comments in the chat box. We've had a lot going by, and uh, we've done our best to track the questions as they've, as they've come in. I'd like to encourage any of the three uh, presenters, if you happen to have seen something in the chat box that you thought was particularly worth bringing up, please feel free uh, to interrupt during this Q&A session and uh, bring that to everyone's attention. I thought it might be worth uh, starting off with something that was raised by, I think, at least four participants. Uh, and that was the issue of land tenure. And if that came up, I just thought it would be worth addressing. Um, in particular, Jamie Montgomery uh, summed it up, a climate change advisor with USAID and the DACHA Bureau. To what extent has this work on scaling thought about issues of land tenure, insecurity, and communal use rights? particularly for women in disadvantaged groups. And uh, I don't know if any of you would like to pick that up uh, in particular. Yes, I'd be happy, I'd be happy to, to make a start. Uh, as we were saying, the, as we look at policy and institutional barriers, uh, land tenure or security of land tenure is often uh, a key one. And in the case of Niger, for example, uh, I don't think we would have seen farmer managed natural regeneration being adopted at scale on some 5 million hectares if USAID and others hadn't been working with the Land Tenure Center over the years to invest in the rural code, which uh, helped to sort of uh, deal with some of the differences between customary tenure and formal tenure. Uh, they developed uh, many needed texts to, to sort of articulate in very clear ways that as farmers invested in land and brought back the productivity of it, that that would be a way for them to secure rights to that land. Uh, in addition to working on the rural code, uh, there were reforms in the forest code, which helped to clarify that as farmers managed and protected trees on farms, that they indeed did have the, the rights to harvest them and manage them. And even uh, whole wood markets emerged uh, on these uh, farmlands. Um, so, uh, but, but it did didn't necessarily require uh, uh, property r uh, titles and such. Uh, it's more the perception from the farmers that as they invest in the land, they are going to benefit from it. And as they uh, start to uh, see more trees on the land, that this is a source of income for them. It's going to help uh, be, be a means to boost their economic well-being. But others may want to add more to that. Yeah. All right. Um, thank you very much, Bob, for that answer. Another question that came in um, during Jerry's presentation. Um, let's see. Oh, uh, Steve Lynn, who is in Brattleboro, Vermont, who is an independent agribusiness consultant, uh, mentioned that Faderbia albida is a special case due to its counter-seasonality, and just asked, what about um, acacias and other legumes? And also, he pointed out that many farmers demand trees that yield food or marketable products. And do you have any comments on that? Uh, that's, a, that's a great question. So Fiderbia is somewhat uh, special in its reverse phenology, but there are quite a range of trees that meet other needs uh, that fall into the uh, fertilizer tree category. For example, that last slide that I showed of Rhoda's farm, she used five different tree species. Some were very fast growing but shorter lived. Some were more medium, uh, had, had were more medi medium in growth rate, uh, but provided great fodder for her animals. Uh, of course, the phytherbia much slower growing, so they were a longer term uh, solution that also provides fuel wood and, and livestock fodder. So. You know, the right tree for the right function and in the right place, I think, is, is a key element. Uh, uh, so doing a stock taking of the full range of uh, trees or uh, shrubby legumes that we often use as well, uh, seeing which ones will grow in, 
in which location, doing some of the modeling that uh, Bob pointed out to look at uh, possible places for interventions. That's all a great way to not see Viderbia's uh, special characteristics as a limitation, but just one more tool in the overall toolbox that we have uh, to identify uh, where these trees fit in. Great. Thank you, Jerry. Um, a question came in that I believe um, Mofat Mugi, who is in the room, may be able to speak to. And that is, how well do the speakers feel that Feed the Future programs have addressed strengthening of local institutions? Oh, thanks, Julie. Yeah, I thought I, I can respond to this one because there are sort of a couple of things that m may be relevant in the context of what we're talking about today. Uh, uh, and it particularly, I think, touches more on human capacity building. I think through through the innovation labs, sort of the former collaborative research uh, programs, there's a, there are a lot of uh, scholarships and other kinds of research capacities that, are, that, that go towards national agricultural research uh, institutes uh, in various countries. But more importantly, towards the institutional capacity building, uh, there are sort of, um, there's a, sort of a new emphasis with uh, USAID forward towards local institutions. And I think with the fixed obligation grants that various missions are supporting, we are seeing that um, capacities are sort of improving based on um, uh, from, from research as well as from sort of local resources. So an example I think in, is in Zambia, for instance. So I think those are some two ways I think that are, are specifically that the future is specific, specifically addressing uh, local institution capacity building, as well as the, the whole question with um, uh, sort of a country-led emphasis. So Feed the Future is implemented uh, sort of addressing key national country priorities. So they may not necessarily translate to local uh, priorities, but by and large, they will, uh, they will, the, the multi-year strategies were developed to sort of respond to what countries have identified as, as issues. And one of the key issues is, of course, institutional capacity building. Anyhow, that's sort of a quick overview of some uh, ways for the future addresses that. Uh, we have a question come in from Miguel, Michelle Jennings uh, with the USAID Africa Bureau. And she asked, uh, does anybody know of a dream agricultural policy that promotes evergreening ag and longer-term solutions? What countries are at the forefront in this area? We've already heard about Malawi, Zambia, Burkina, and others that are exemplary. She would love a, a bit of extrapolation on this. Um, sorry, folks, we uh, lost Bob there for a moment, but he is switching to another headset, so he'll be able to pick up here. Oh, okay. Much better. Thanks very much for that question, and uh, fortunately we have Dennis Garrity in the room with us, who's uh, been a champion for evergreen agriculture and working at the country level to uh, help countries, uh, some 20 different countries in Africa, a shift to to be have a more favorable environment for scaling up some of these practices. Um, I just add that um, uh, uh, as we move forward and we see these restoration opportunities, uh, a number of governments have come together and subscribed to what we call the bond challenge, where Rwanda is among them, where the, the, the national leadership there has said, yes, we can uh, practically do border-to-border -border restoration and uh, uh, have committed to restoring millions of hectares. Uh, a number of countries, I think Niger is probably poised to do this as well. Um, and so that sort of top level political commitment is one thing. And then sort of diving into what needs to change if we want to make uh, progress accelerate uh, and make it even easier to enable the farmers to do, to do these practices. Are there some key barriers that we can, can, can reduce? Um, uh, the, the work in Burkina Faso, for example, uh, that had the, the leadership of the Forest Service involved and others, they've made some progress, but there, more progress is needed. 
uh, because, uh, as was mentioned earlier, tenure is often a key thing, particularly for women. Because, uh, and, and even now, there's there's uh, land use. Uh, uh, where the government, and on the one hand, is sort of saying, yes, there are ways that uh, we'd like to expand agricultural production and giving out large land grants to people that are in there knocking down trees and taking a step backwards, and, and other farmers that have invested in farmer managed after generation agroforestry systems are sometimes losing their land as, as, as uh, uh, cities expand others. So, um, uh, but let me pass it on to Dennis, and he maybe wants to speak more directly to that. Well, thank you, Bob. Um, yes, very briefly, I think, uh, as you know, we're, we've been doing a lot of thinking about dream policies for uh, evergreen agriculture and the, and the uh, scaling up of, of these uh, great practices in the uh, partnership to create an evergreen agriculture in Africa. And I th I've been thinking about two things as, as, as this discussion has gone forward. One is that um, part of our dream policy, of course, is the great efforts of many countries now to develop their own national strategies for scaling up evergreen agriculture. Tanzania, Ethiopia, Kenya, Niger, um, a number of others on the drawing boards. And so that mobilizes government attention at the highest levels and it cascades downwards. I think that's one very big opportunity for us. And there's a lot of sharing now of these, of these policies. Secondly, um, as we talk about capacity building, I think what's riveting our attention more and more is the need to develop a cadre of um, <clears throat> of trained, uh, train the trainers, um, people at, at international, national, local levels throughout the continent because the big problem now is that there's tremendous amount of real international awareness of these opportunities but at the national and local levels, there is a need for capacity to actually do these concrete facilitation roles at the ground level. And that's our next big challenge. Thank you so much for stepping in. On a, without advance notice, we appreciate your comments. All right. Um, we've gotten a lot of very robust questions coming into the chat box. So if we're not able to answer all of them today. Uh, we will definitely share the chat box transcript with the presenters and see if we can keep a conversation going uh, via AgriLinks and make sure that uh, all of your questions are addressed. Um, I thought uh, an interesting question came in also um, from Jamie Montgomery, climate change advisor in Washington with USAID, who said, um, I don't see much discussion of how impacts of climate change should be considered when discussing the need to scale up certain agricultural practices. Will these be, will the practices you've all been mentioning be robust under future climate change scenarios? And what is the potential for expanding practices that, while good in the near term, may be maladaptive in the longer term? Uh, that's a great question because in some regions we're seeing the effects of climate change to the extent that farming systems have had to change already. Uh, in general, it's not true in exactly every case, but in general, the approaches that we outlined uh, give farmers an advantage, a leg up uh, in the face of more erratic climate uh, more erratic weather patterns, including increased rainfall events, more intense rainfall events, as well as the extended droughts that uh, are often associated with climate change. Uh, in agroforestry, for example, a, a robust study covering West Africa, East and Southern Africa, looking at the effects of uh, evergreen agriculture on uh, yield stability. The stability of yields to farmers is almost as important as uh, overall high yields. So the use of agroforestry, these uh, evergreen agriculture systems, actually stabilized yields, especially in times when there was excessive rainfall. So we can map out to a, to a limited degree now uh, what types of um, impacts climate change will have on specific areas. but. I think the approaches that we've outlined, they, they are, I believe, robust. And in the face of uncertainty about the specifics, specific impacts of climate change, they offer perhaps the, the, the surest route to resilience over the long term. And then as we get more information and are able, 
are able to refine our predictions and uh, mapping ability of the impacts of climate change, we can further adapt each one of those strategies. Uh, uh, so overall, I think it it really does present the, the most robust, um, best bet route uh, to meeting the unknowns of climate change as well as some of the knowns. Uh, thank you very much, Jerry. Okay, I'm coming through. We have time for perhaps one more question or so. I don't know if, if please flag it for me if there's something that you noticed that seemed particularly interesting. Um, let's see. I, I, or, go ahead, Jerry. No? Yeah. Uh, I was just, I saw Jeremy Chevrier's uh, question, can wild edible drought resistant grains be considered for future cropping under climate change scenarios? Uh, certain, certainly the, the uh, use of some wild um, species or races of plants is very important in plant breeding programs. I can think of two cases in particular that USAID funds. One is on chickpeas, so the investigators went to the, uh, uh, the centers of origin of chickpea and looked at some of the uh, drought tolerant traits, some of the disease resistant traits of wild uh, relatives of our crop chickpeas and those can be through plant breeding introduced into uh, our crop varieties to meet uh, the changes expected under climate change. Uh, another program that we're looking at uh, and funding is um, uh, the breeding of perennial types of sorghum for particularly for West Africa and including Ethiopia as well. So a perennial type of sorghum with deeper roots, uh, more resilient to uh, drought and uh, a better protector of the soil all could uh, have great, uh, great impacts on climate change or resilience to climate change. I also noticed that although there was a great deal of enthusiasm in the chat box for the methods that you presented, there were some concerns about um, labor intensivity and also a, a lack of market return for input dealers or other private actors as there is with improved seeds or purchase inputs. And um, didn't know if it would be useful to address some of those types of concerns. Uh, this is Jerry Glover, just for my part. Uh, I think what we've seen in many cases, well, one, uh, when farmers adopt some of these practices over millions of hectares, I think uh, it's pretty clear that the economics were uh, benefiting the, the, in, in favor of these approaches. But, um, uh, you know, in, in the development community, we often look to solutions such as improved crop cultivars, uh, improved access and availability of uh, mineral fertilizers, and that's certainly very needed and, and, and great. But those often come at a great economic risk to farmers when they use them without these improved land and water management practices. So by putting in place uh, better management of, of soil and water, uh, you can, the farmers actually reap more economic benefits from these uh, purchased inputs, more efficient use of the fertilizers, that's been shown in numerous studies, and uh, more effective capture of, of the benefits of improved crop varieties. If, uh, if your soil holds more water, your drought tolerant maize variety is going to do even better. Uh, it's not that they do only, they produce only under very dry conditions, but they actually can do better under moderately moist conditions. So the extent to which these land and water management practices that we've outlined are employed, farmers often uh, harvest economic benefits in the form of more effective use of their purchased inputs. Thank you, Jerry. That was a really uh, great, great summary of um, the response to that question. And I think we have one more question we'd like to address, which is um, the one at the end from Thomas Summerhalter. And we thought perhaps Mike be, might be able to uh, address the question of livestock's role in farming systems and how to integrate livestock into some of what's been addressed today. Uh, 
Uh, thank you for the good question. Uh, uh, I'm not an expert on this, so I think maybe some of the others can uh, chime in as well. Uh, the question had to do with integrating livestock into farming systems, uh, where you have uh, question where you're be using residue to do some of the things that Jerry had talked about in conserving moisture and in building up soil organic matter. Uh, sometimes there's a there's tension in that the livestock itself uh, is a consumer of the crop residue, and as the question as uh, Thomas says, uh, livestock is a provider of manure, so they provide soil fertility by recycling some of the uh, residue. Um, so in the farmers that we've talked with, uh, there is tension. Uh, many of them like to keep residue on their fields, and they do. Uh, and then they try to find other ways of feeding livestock. One option that a uh, number of farmers use is to use um, trees. Uh, a lot of trees, uh, Jerry talked about the multiple use of trees. One of the major use of trees is uh, high quality forage or high quality browse. Uh, so taking some of the pressure off uh, crop residue by incorporating trees into your uh, production system. Uh, gives you multiple benefits, you conserve some of the residue, but you also increase the quality of the browse, particularly during the dry season. Um, I think I'll stop there. Maybe there are some of the others who would like to contribute to that, uh, to this question. Um, all right, we've got time for just a uh, comment or so. Great. Just very briefly, you know, uh, places the world like Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, those communities, many in those communities, need to actually consume more meat. It's uh, very has very concentrated nutrients. So where will that extra food for those livestock come from in the future? Well, I think it's pretty clear that uh, relying only on crop residues uh, from our staple food crops is going to be a big problem. Uh, you know, some of those residues are very important for soil and for other uses. So as Mike just pointed out. Introducing uh, more perennial-based systems, perennial uh, approaches that can relieve the burden of the crop residues to feed those livestock. It's going to provide important food security as well as economic security for farmers to to diversify out of sole crop uh, sole crop focus. Livestock typically are much more valuable than uh, the crops that are produced. So it's actually a development pathway uh, out of poverty in many cases to, to uh, step into livestock uh, enterprises. The only way we're going to do that in many cases is to introduce new uh, sources of feed that are much more resilient to climate change and much more sustainable in terms of uh, land and water health. So uh, I think that these uh, uh, many of these solutions produced, uh, outlined today uh, will allow opportunities for much more livestock production, actually. Thank you so much, Jerry. Well, we are running on the end of our time. Uh, if anyone would like to make any final comments, feel free. Uh, but I think that you've done a really great job at addressing a lot of questions that have come in. Thank you all to our participants um, for challenging our speakers today. And uh, I just wanted to quickly draw your attention to a MPEP seminar that is coming up tomorrow, also relating to the topic of scaling, uh, entitled Overcoming Barriers to Scale to Reach the Poor. And uh, I just put that link in the chat box in case anyone would like to join that seminar and webinar tomorrow. But I'd like to uh, send out a huge thank you to Craig, Jerry, Bob, Mofat, Mike, and a few other special guests we had here in our webinar control room today. Um, thank you all for helping us pull off this webinar, and um, thanks especially to our audience. We really appreciate our loyal Ag Sector Council participants, and we hope to see you in February on the 26th. Uh, so thank you all, and we will go ahead and sign off.